Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to come over and sit on your side of the room. I'd like to thank you all for coming here this uh, morning and joining us. This afternoon, sorry. The days, uh, one of the great things about uh, so-called Car Week is the fact that uh, time becomes a very fluid thing. Um, I still think it's actually Tuesday somehow, but I know it must be Tuesday somewhere. Um, but uh, very, very happy that you took the time to join us this afternoon and uh, to talk about a topic that I think is very, very important, certainly to me and I think to most people who are involved with the collector car hobby business. Um, and that's, we all love these cars and, and motorcycles that uh, we celebrate and what will happen to those cars and motorcycles in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, thinking back on the fact that collecting art goes back to the ancient Romans, and I think that car collecting, no matter what may go on in the current environment, has a great future because people are very passionately connected to it. So we're going to talk a little bit about this afternoon the ways that uh, I think that we can say that the future of this hobby is in very, very safe and capable and uh, enthusiastic hands. And I also just want to uh, take a moment to make a nod to the uh, Revs Institute in uh, Naples, Florida, because I shamelessly stole one of their themes for the title of this talk, uh, A Bright Future for the Past, uh, a conversation with tomorrow's restorers, because um, at the recent uh, Revs uh, symposium, uh, the title of the symposium was uh, the, A Future for the Past. And I think that that's something that we have to think about on a daily basis, and the best way to do that is to take a look at what we're doing to protect that. And I am joined here on the stage by some uh, two great old friends and some new younger friends. Uh, going in order, we have on the end Dave Kinney, uh, who is uh, a great automotive appraiser and consultant writer. Uh, he writes for many magazines, uh, Haggerty's Magazine, Octane Magazine, Auto Week, uh, he is also the person, frankly, responsible for me being an appraiser. Uh, he was the one that tricked me into doing this 15 years ago. And uh, so he's to blame if, if, you, uh, if, you, if you don't like me very much. Uh, but thank you very much, Dave. And uh, Dave... I'm, I'm the only one in the room who doesn't like you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dave is also the founder of the Haggerty Price Guide. And uh, he is somebody who... Um, is an internationally known expert on classic car values and what they actually mean. Uh, sitting next to him is Paul Russell, uh, Paul Russell and Company. Uh, Paul is, without hyperbole, one of the leading restorers on the planet today, uh, who has won more prizes at Concours d'Elegance competitions than can be counted here. Certainly, we would use the entire hour uh, recounting uh, Paul's uh, uh, Concours successes, but also somebody who has been committed for a very long time to the next generation, partly out of self-interest, because obviously Paul needs to keep his shop running, but also to make sure that the talents and the skills are passed along to a new generation. And as such, uh, both uh, Dave and Paul serve on the advisory council for McPherson College, and Paul is indeed the chairman of that advisory council, and they do what they can to uh, support the, uh, the next generation. Uh, next, I'm joined by the people who are actually going to do it, which is very exciting, uh, Ben Falconer, uh, who is uh, the third year recipient of a Phil Hill scholarship from the Pebble Beach Company Foundation. And uh, he has had a, we'll find out a little bit more about his journey, but he's had a very interesting journey uh, so far in his uh, career in uh, education and in this uh, business, and I think is very emblematic of where we're going and how we get there. Um, and especially something, something that, that he's quoted as saying really resonated with me because I love art. And uh, I think that these cars are like the great masterpieces of fine art. And I know that's something that has touched him very much as well. Uh, next to him is an old friend of mine uh, who I, I like very much, uh, Nate McLaughlin, not least of which because he defended the incredibly wild pants that I was wearing last year uh, on the stage in the, uh, in the uh, award uh, ceremony. And um, Nate is also someone who has seen through his education at McPherson and uh, these opportunities that the um, Pell Beach Company Foundation scholarships have given. He is the first recipient of the Jules J. Human 
um, scholarship. And uh, everyone's very excited about that and uh, the opportunities that it offers uh, the uh, students going forward. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Dylan Riley. He's a junior at McPherson. And uh, I also uh, love the fact that Again, this is a story of a journey. And I think we've all been on a journey. I know I certainly have, Paul has, and uh, Dave has, of coming into the car hobby with a passion in one area and discovering, as he, as he wants to make it his business, uh, something else entirely. Now I'm going to take a moment to waste everyone's time um, because I heard a fascinating story sitting in the green room. <coughs> and uh, because they didn't quite get it right uh, on the plane, um, I just have to add this. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dylan. Happy birthday to you. People kept asking, oh, are you going to sing? I said, no, 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 no chance. <laughs> um, but um, so now to put this conversation into a, a context, I mentioned before the uh, Pebble Beach Company Foundation scholarships. And um, Dylan is also, I forgot to mention, a Phil Hill uh, scholarship awardee. Um, the Pebble Beach uh, Company Foundation uh, works with a number of educational uh, institutions, including McPherson, to support the future of the hobby. Obviously. Um, we can't think of Pebble Beach in 2040 if there's no one to restore the cars that we're going to see on the lawn. And in addition to McPherson, uh, they also work with the Academy of Art Institute in San Francisco and also with Stanford University uh, in their CARS program to provide support uh, for students uh, working in the uh, collectible automobile industry and in future conversations we hope to bring some of those students as well. Uh, we started, I must immodestly say, uh, with McPherson because I am so incredibly impressed with the program. McPherson is the only uh, college that offers a four-year degree in restoration studies and I think that uh, it's something that really makes it truly stand apart from other educational um, organizations. Let me just start with you, Paul, for a second. Uh, you've been involved with McPherson for a very long time and how were you first uh, attracted to McPherson and how did you make the connection? Well, I was... Um approached by a person in the Mercedes-Benz Club who was in charge of the Mercedes-Benz Club National Education Foundation. And he said, do you know, this was uh, 16 or so years ago, and do you know about this program at McPherson? Which I didn't, so he explained a few things about it. And uh, he said, you know, this May we're having uh, a board meeting and uh, tour the facilities and you really ought to come out and have a look and uh, based on what he told me about the program I thought it was really interesting and I thought there was a a real need for educating the future uh, restorers, curators, historians, uh, even media people in the old car scene. So I went and had a look and I was incredibly impressed with um, the program and um, it was in its, um, you know, in a developmental stage and it was right at that point where they were considering taking what well, had been a two-year associate's degree program and making it into a, a four-year bachelor's degree uh, in um, applied arts and that really resonated with me um, and I felt it was a great direction and they asked me to joined the advisory board and I became kind of the self-appointed representative of, of the restoration field, you know, and to try to help the students understand um, the field outside of academia and uh, what it's like uh, to work in the field on a day-to-day -day basis and I thought I could contribute something. And I think that um, having, I went to music school and I know lots of people who study uh, music and the culinary arts, etc. And I think that having the presence of people working in the field make a big difference in the outlook of the students in their, both their studies and in their uh, intentions for the future. Um, Nate, um, what was it about the McPherson program that attracted you, that wanted you to go there? Um, 
When I was first looking into um, college in general, I was not the type of person that was actually going to be going to college. Um, I kind of fell in love with cars kind of late. And um, when I found McPherson College, I ended up finding it through uh, a quick Google search. Um, what is the best car school in the country? And McPherson College was right at the top of that list. And I said, OK, I want to go take a look there. So I, uh, I scheduled a plane visit. And I'm from uh, New York. So I got on a plane and flew to the middle of Kansas and uh, um, stepped foot on campus. And I just absolutely fell in love. And um, I figured that there was no way I could go anywhere else. It was, it was kind of like love at first sight. Did you get an opportunity on that first visit to speak to a lot of students and a lot of the faculty members? Yes, yep. I, uh, I spoke with um, specifically the engines professor. Uh, right when I walked in the door, I was given a tour by the professor and kind of got to pick his brain a little bit about what, what it was really like to be there and what, what the personal connections that you'd have with your professor. And uh, it, was, it was awesome. And uh, Dylan, when? Obviously, you're a great enthusiast, and I loved reading your bio about uh, how you fell madly in love with, uh, with muscle cars at a young age. And so did you come to McPherson with a particular plan in mind? Oh, this is what I love. This is what I want to learn. This is what I want to do. Um, so I got into cars kind of late. Like, my dad has a construction company, so he didn't really know about a whole lot about cars growing up. And so coming to the school, it was just kind of like, I didn't really know what to expect, and I was open to learn about anything. And uh, this school, I knew that I was going to get to learn about every different aspect about restoring a vehicle. And my love for cars happened since I was young. And uh, we used to have car shows all the time for where I grew up. And it was mainly muscle cars and stuff. So getting to come here and seeing what we had and realizing that it was um, from, the, from the very basics and very early cars, and then being able to use that and grow and use it at, like, for any different vehicle was something I was uh, Really, really happy to learn, so. And uh, Ben, I know that, again, the range of the cars that, 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 you, that the students at McPherson get to work on is something that impressed me very much because my tastes run the full gamut. And it's very interesting to me to see young people that had such an interest in such a wide range of cars. Do, did you come to the school with that interest? Did you develop it as you went through your student time there, or? Um, kind of like Bill and I. I grew up like, like in muscle cars. Uh, I got a 1967 Firebird for my first car. Um, built it with my dad and still drive it today. Uh, and that's what got me into cars, but then once I got to school, I started getting into Ferraris and pre-war cars and stuff that I didn't even think I'd ever get the chance to work on. Um, and now I'm really into Ferraris. And now looking back, when I was in high school, I didn't even know what a 250 GTO Ferrari was, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> But now that I've gone to McPherson College, I've, I know what most cars are and the value and <coughs> how awesome they are. So. And uh, Dave, um, you obviously are somebody who has been very, very, very closely involved in the program at McPherson and committed to it. On your first visit to the campus, uh, what was it that most impressed you about what was going on? Well. Um, I would say that the knowledge of the, of the faculty and the camaraderie between the uh, students uh, and the faculty, um, plus, uh, you know, there's a spirit of working together that probably wouldn't come if, uh, if McPherson was a really big town. Um, you know, you, you're in the sink or swim uh, uh, mode most of the time at a small school. I went to a small college also in Kansas City uh, myself, and, uh, you know, I, I was able to realize the importance of, a, uh, of an education from a small college, I would not have survived at a large college. I went to uh, a large high school and uh, failed miserably um, and went to a smaller school. Well, I didn't fail miserably. I failed mediocrely. Um, <laughs> Don failure. Donald's aware of the license plate on my Ferrari, uh, which is my high school GPA, uh, 2.3. 2 um, <laughs> So I have people who are following me behind me, and they, they point to the Ferrari and say, don't be like that guy. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, uh, it's very important to me to pass the knowledge forward. 
uh, and and McPherson does the does the job with a four-year degree. You know, this is not just about learning how to fix cars. It's learning how to run a business. It's learning how to live with people. It's learning how you work uh, and how things function when you work together. I mean, the whole teamwork makes the dream work. And uh, I was most impressed, actually. Um, by what are known as the sheds, which are just off campus, uh, where almost everyone has their own small space, sometimes in a bigger space, and they work together to solve problems off campus, car problems. And uh, it's just this wonderful thing where, you know, somebody's got the knowledge, somebody's got the tools, somebody's got the time, and they all come together and they make things happen. Uh, it's, it was actually a magical experience to see that. I didn't have that when I, was a, when I was in college for cars. I had it for other things, so I had to develop it for, uh, for cars. But uh, um, I, I'm, just, I'm just universally impressed with everybody I've met at, uh, uh, at the school. And Ben, another question for you. Um, you would have the opportunity as a young person to go to any number of, of schools to learn technical skills in repairing new cars and becoming a new car technician. Uh, what was it about what McPherson offered in terms of actually learning restoration, diagnostic, and repair skills that was different than what else you might have been able to do? Um, so I had the opportunity to go to Lincoln Tech or uh, WyoTech. I had full ride scholarships to both actually. Um, but then once I looked up McPherson College and saw old cars and that's what I was into. I, I learned how to paint in high school at uh, concurrent enrollment. I went to community college at the same time as my high school classes. And uh, I wanted more than that. I didn't want to be doing collision work. Nothing against collision work, but I like old cars. And uh, so seeing that McPherson College taught you everything from step one to the final step to bring them to Pebble Beach made me really want to do that. I didn't want to just do small repairs. I wanted to do the whole thing. So. And uh, Dylan, one of the things that I know that uh, many people in the audience, uh, I know that Dave and I and, and Paul have certainly heard this, in our travels that, oh, you know, young people just aren't interested in, in cars and not interested, certainly not interested in old cars. So do you find that setting your, your, your classmates at McPherson aside, because obviously we know where their interests lie, yep. your friends, do they think that what you're doing is strange? Um, most of the time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just don't really understand that uh, why I'd want to spend the money to buy something that breaks down all the time and that's something that I have to fix while I can just go out and buy something new that I'm not going to have any problems with. But the way I look at it is if, like, if you don't have those breakdowns, if like, you go from, one, like, from point A to B with absolutely no issues, like, there's no story. You, know? like, there's no, you don't have a, like, a cool memory to remember that trip by. And I'm, I'm pretty... Uh, I like the, the journey instead of just getting to the destination, so. The, these guys, by the way, are actually not McPherson students. They are actors hired to play <laughs> McPherson students to deliver the perfect responses to every one of my questions, which they have no idea what they were going to be. Thanks for memorizing the script, guys. Very well done. <laughs> um, Nate, um, do you find that when people come up to you and talk about what it is that you're doing and what you're interested in, that they are in some way surprised that you might be interested in this? And what, if any, work have you done to try to get other people of your age interested in what it is that you're doing? Um, I definitely think that people are surprised. Um, I remember specifically in high school when I said uh, I was going to McPherson College, um, everybody was like, you're going where? for one, and because on the East Coast, no one really knew, and um, everybody was gonna go to a big school and um, you know do regular things. But um, for me, it was kind of like, this is my passion, so I wanna go this direction, and to other people, they were just, why are you gonna go work on old cars? Is there even a market for that? Is there even jobs for that? What, do you, what are your plans, you know? and um, so I got a lot of pushback in high school be when I decided to come out here and do this. And um, I would have never expected to be sitting here today when we were talking about that. But, um, you know, I think that a, a big part of it is um, to kind of expose people because 
most people, especially at an event like this, most people will never get to see these cars ever. And they don't realize how special these cars are and how special the history of these cars are. And to me, that's huge. And if you can just expose people to it, that's, that can be the difference. And it's, uh, it's, it's great that, that you all keep coming back to this theme of stories, stories and, and personal connections. And um, Ben, what was your biggest surprise from the time you started at school to where you are now that you didn't expect at all to happen in, in the educational exposure that you have? Probably the support. I mean, I didn't think I'd ever meet Jay Leno. I didn't, I mean, my, my mom is a huge fan of Jay Leno and she always wanted to meet him and then she cried when I got to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and he supports our school and you support our school and Paul Russell. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I didn't think there were this many people in this industry and they're all involved with McPherson College, so. And uh, Paul, um, one of the things, obviously, I mentioned only slightly in jest in introducing you that you had a self-interest in supporting a program like this. But what do you hope to bring to these students at McPherson in terms of um, letting them know what it is really like to work in the industry and what they should be thinking about as they make their decisions about how they're going to proceed in the industry? Um, really, there's many aspects. Um, one is to really value the opportunity that they have at a school that has a full bachelor's degree program. What I love about the graduates is they come out into the industry with more than just, you know, you can go someplace and learn how to weld. You can go someplace to learn how to rebuild an engine. But to provide some context to what you're doing, the historical uh, significance of what it means, why it's important, uh, what was going on in the world when this car was built, um, you know, we see restoring some old Ferraris built in post-war Italy where materials were incredibly dear, but uh, highly skilled craftsmen were fairly common. And take the paint off a car and it's built with a bunch of little tiny pieces of sheet metal this big, you know, because they're saving street signs and building cars with them. So, you know, the attractiveness of a student that comes out of there with a broader perspective of the world and the ability to communicate with my customers and um, uh, is, is a very attractive proposition. Also, what I love about my job is I learn new things every single day. And to try to influence the students is that McPherson is a great foundation. Hopefully what you develop there is a thirst for learning because it's hopefully going to continue every day of your life. And it's, it's just a great way to jumpstart that. And uh, actually, it's a great uh, segue to you, Dave, because I know you, like me, not quite to the same manic degree that I have, have had a number of different careers uh, before we got to where we are now. And uh, I know that one of the things that uh, you had said to me that you really liked about the McPherson program was the range of it so that people can be exposed to various things and make their own decisions and be able to develop as they go along. How have you seen that work out? Well, um, you know, it's, it, life is a journey. Uh, you know, Donald, you and I have talked about this hundreds of times, and you never know exactly where you're going to be a year from now or 10 years from now or anything else. Uh, I met some fantastic people along the way that helped me on my journey. And most of my friends when I was young was, were involved in, in uh, things other than automobiles. And I think that, you know, when you have a, a situation like a college that, that, as Paul said, gives you a liberal arts education as well as gives you a background in the skills, you get to blossom. And, you know, Donald, you and I, I say, think it's safe to say, you know, with, we had a very convoluted journey and it took us a very long time to get here. Um, but uh, these gentlemen and the other uh, students and the, they're not all gentlemen because there's ladies who go to uh, McPherson as well, uh, including a recent graduate here who's out here with the crew. Um, and uh, um, it, 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 is, it is a pathway and it is something that uh, these gentlemen have the benefit of thousands of years of experience uh, and get to learn from you know, some of the best and many of the best in the world at any given time. Uh, there are people who come to visit McPherson. I, I had a friend who I didn't know his son was interested in, uh, in starting a career in automotive and uh, I ran into him 
a few months ago when he was wearing a McPherson t-shirt and he's an entering freshman. And uh, when I met him and he was not with his dad and he had a McPherson t-shirt, I didn't come up to him because I thought it'd be awful creepy for me to introduce <laughs> myself as somebody on the advisory board. And then I ran into his dad a few minutes later. And I just can't tell you how excited he is to, you know, to, to, to going to be involved in something that he grew up with and something that he knows he can make a difference. Um, he's arriving um, next month with a 356 Porsche that is a family non-treasure, uh, kind of a, an old beat up one that his dad's gonna help drive him out there. And he's got a, a four year restoration project. And Paul, we all know that could be a 50 year restoration <laughs> project um, that, that he's going to do. And, and you know, so he's coming with his workbook and his workbook is a car. I think that's wonderful. That, that's absolutely fantastic. And uh, Dylan, speaking of work and practical application, Studying things in a classroom is a terrific thing, and even working on the bench. Uh, you had a great opportunity uh, here just the other day, the uh, Pebble Beach Tour d'Elegance. You helped prepare a car for the tour. And uh, you talk about a responsibility. You've got a great old car, and this car was in the preservation class. Yep. And so uh, you had to make sure that it could uh, acquit itself well on a 50-mile tour. And uh, by the way, yeah, that guy from McPherson helped us, and we broke down the first four miles. So tell us about what it was like working under the pressure of real life? Um, it was really cool, uh, given that opportunity, because we, we got to the car, we prepped it, uh, we, we filled it up with gas, and just going through the little checklist to make sure that everything was perfect so that there would be no issues out on the road was, uh, it kind of felt like we were a little pit crew, you know? It was, it was really cool to have that experience. So. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it is a very interesting thing to think about one of the other aspects that the hobby is moving more towards experiential ownership. So having a really great looking car is not quite enough. The car has got to actually perform as well as you want it to look. Um, ben, have you worked on the uh, 300, the Mercedes 300 project? I have not. I've uh, not. been into it. I think, I don't know if any of us have yet. Have you worked not on it yet? yet? Unfortunately. Okay. You want to talk about that a little bit, Paul? Um. So the, a couple of years ago, the uh, school uh, got authorization, and which is evidence of a little side note worth noting is that the support of the restoration program within the upper levels of the school, the hierarchy, the school president is here this weekend, and the board of trustees authorized them to go out and purchase a uh, Mercedes 300S Cabriolet it was chosen because it's a distinctive and, and highly regarded mark that had a possibility of being accepted at Pebble Beach someday. And uh, we had, uh, the board and a, a couple of other uh, members uh, of the college faculty as well as uh, people from the strategic planning um, group at Haggerty Insurance met in Chicago to, to talk about a 10 years uh, strategic plan for the school and we felt it was important to have you know a, a project that allowed the students and the supporters of the school and the faculty and everything else to really visualize what is this process all about and so the decision was made we should really undertake a restoration make it real <laughs> and our goal is to get that car on the lawn at Pebble Beach now Pebble Beach is a prestigious event, but Pebble Beach itself is the inspirational goal, but not the real purpose. The real purpose is to teach the students um, teamwork, project management, collaboration, documentation, um, productivity, you know, responsibility. You, you know, you've, you've signed up to do this. Let's get her done. And um, because of its being worked on during the school year and then occasionally in between semesters and that, um, it can't be done in a commercial schedule. You know, it's a uh, project that I think, Abigail, we're targeting for 2023. Um, and we're hoping that it becomes an example. Now, getting the students to kind of buy in on this that, well, I'm never gonna see that finished. I'm only gonna be here four years and that. But it's still important. You become part of the story. 
you become part of the provenance, if you will, of that 300S. So uh, on the one hand, it's a, it's a reflection of how strongly the school, how important this program is to a school that has all the other usual liberal arts programs. And through that strategic planning process, it's actually uh, really woken up the rest of the school and become a model for other departments and everything else to follow a similar path. Um, so we hope you'll all be here in uh, you know four years in order to witness the debut of that project. It's going to be a great party in, uh, in the middle of Kansas, that's for sure. Um, ben, uh, where do you see yourself at this moment? Now, granted the fact that um, I just said that my path has been a, a circuitous one, as has Dave's. Right now, today, this afternoon, where do you see yourself going in the restoration business? Um, I see myself working on the cars for a long time. I don't think I can see myself managing anything or doing anything like that. I like using my hands, and I think I'd get jittery if I was sitting at a desk. <laughs> and I'd end up going out there and working and not doing my job I'm supposed to be doing if I was doing that. Um, I'm a, I like painting. I learned how to paint in high school, like I said earlier, so I definitely see myself being a painter uh, for a very long time. And maybe someday being able to do my own thing, whether or not that be running a shop or just helping out run another shop or run the shop I start working for in a year, who knows. Um, I think that um, if I could see myself in uh, a few years from now after being graduated. Uh, I want to work in a shop that does concourse level restorations and I'm also very heavily into paint and that's that's my my big goal um, ever since being at McPherson College um, like many I showed up loving muscle cars and had a very uh, narrow view of what the car industry was and um, that really really changed dramatically since I got to the college uh, I fell in love with early air-cooled Porsches, and uh, I've actually had the opportunity to intern at a shop in Denver uh, for two years in a row now, uh, working on those cars. And um, so I hope to be working somewhere in that mark. And Dylan. So like I said earlier, I really like preservations. So if, if there's a way that what I want to do is I want to take cars that haven't uh, ran and drove for the past 25 years, find them, like hunt them down, and then take them, get them back on the road. And what's cool about with our school is that we're gonna get a chance to learn every aspect that's needed to put the cars back on the road. And whether it's managing a shop or working for a shop that does that, it's finding them and uh, being able to like fix them up and drive them, that's, that's what I wanna do. And uh, Paul, I wanna ask you a question. If using the time machine or the wayback machine, depending on, on which one you, you want to, what would, have, what would your professional career look like had the option of something like McPherson College been available to you when you were their age? I'd be a lot smarter right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I've been in, very fortunate in business, and, I've, and it's been 41 years now. But, you know, the first 15 of these could have been a lot simpler. And uh, I didn't go to Harvard Business School, but I paid a lot more money than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, just the whole environment there, the whole package, um, not only the technical side, but, you know, the business side. And, you know, uh, having an entire faculty full of mentors, you know, one of the things that I love about our uh, annual board meetings there is that the, they do structure things so that the board members can spend a lot of time with the students. So we get to ask the students, how are your teachers doing? And it's really unanimous when I talk to them and I say, these guys are amazing. And if I were to call one of these guys up at 8.30 at night and say, I got an issue with this, they'd be right there to help me. Um, so it's, it's just a great environment that, that to really nurture this whole um, enthusiasm in this whole career track and I, I just love the projectile that, um, that McPherson is on and I would love to have had that opportunity when I was 20 to take that path. So. 
And in sort of a, a lightning rod, I'd like to ask you in order, uh, Dylan, if you could tell, share with this audience one thing that they should know about McPherson, what would it be? Um, pretty much just the instructors are the top notch, like best people that we could ever ask for. And with it being such a small school, the communication we have and just, you're not just a number, like you go to any other big school, it's the personal relationships are like second or none, so. Nate? I think for me, um, the connections are absolutely huge. Um, I mean, just for an example, we're sitting here today speaking with you, but um, we do an annual internship fair. I think we had over 28 employers show up to our internship fair looking for not just interns, but also full-time positions. And then we had a really fat binder of people who could not make it to the campus who also wanted to provide jobs for people. And just having those connections, um, you can go any, almost anywhere in the country and work on what you want to work on because people know the name McPherson and they want a, they want a student from the college. Ben. Um, you'll never regret hiring a McPherson College graduate. Oh, there you go. That's a tagline. That's a marketing tagline. If I've ever heard one. <laughs> and your phone number for everything. <laughs> no, but it's a it's a great college. My biggest thing when I was looking for a college actually was that I got a full college experience by going here. Um, I didn't want to just go to a tech school mostly because I wanted to live in the dorms. Surprisingly. Got my fair share of that. Don't want to do that again, but <laughs> I know why I wanted to do it. Um, and you get to have fun. It's still a college. We do everything a college student wants to do. And uh, like Dave Kinney mentioned about the uh, sheds, we have uh, awesome places to work on our cars. We spend weekends out there, staying up till 4 a.m. sometimes working on our cars. And that's where our skills come from. And I think all of us are very, very successful. And we all do something awesome. And no one is going to mention the potato cannon. Um, <laughs> do we have a microphone for audience questions? Yes, we do. Here it comes. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone. OK. You have a question over here. Um, I just want to speak out. And I, I'm Barbara Russell, by the way. And I just want to speak out about how McPherson is just attracting the most amazing caliber of student. Um, when you go to one of these annual um, um, board of directors meetings, um, there's, a, there's a, um, an award ceremony for the kids. And the kids in the automotive restoration program aren't just getting awards in that program. They're getting awards from the history department and the music department and the psychology department. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows that the quality of kids that's going there is just great. Thank you, yes, about the, the benefits of the liberal arts uh, setting. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, and, and thank you for coming and talking to us about this. My colleague, my colleague and I are, uh, we're tourism professors, but our focus is on automobile heritage. And one of the areas we're looking at is the almost unbelievable growth in the hobby, Donald, as you call it. And if you've been coming to Pebble Beach for decades you'll see this incredible increase in interest. So in terms of the educational programs that you guys have, is there any interest in the, your program and other similar programs on the part of students from other parts of the world? Because the, the hobby is growing everywhere. I think, uh, Paul, there are a number of students from uh, other countries at McPherson. Yes, yes. Um, and and I think more coming, but they've had uh, inquiries from uh, the UK and the Mideast and Korea and Mexico and Canada, everywhere. We've got a, uh, you have a uh, student from China right from now China, as well. yes, exactly. And um, he's a little bit older than your average age. Uh, and from what I understand, he owns a business, uh, an automotive restoration business in China. And his plan is to go back and teach those best practices to people, so he wants to pass those skills on. Um, and so, yeah, the, I mean, the effect is worldwide. And what you're saying, I mean, you know, Paul would, would double down on this, but 30 years ago, the, 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 the part of the restoration, it was paint, it was bodywork, it was chrome, 
Now it's history, and you start with the history and you build on that foundation, and so it's the most important part sometimes. You find out amazing things about automobiles when you do the research, and that's part of the 300S project and part of, uh, part of what these, these guys learn how to do. Um, and so, you know, they have an extensive library of automotive uh, information and they have access to even more. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not just the basics, it's, it's, it's become, a, you know, a big part of it now, so. It is, uh, we'll take the next question. It is uh, one of those things, as well as part of the 300S project, one of the things I was most impressed with when I was walking through was that they actually took time in, in taking the car apart, they saw that there were hand markings that the upholsters had, had made when building the seats, and they actually looked to duplicate the handwriting, that wonderful, very specific 1940s, 1950s German handwriting in doing it. That's the level of work and education that's, that's going on here. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Baldwin. Um, I have my Via Cross over at the Japanese Automotive Initiative, and my question is because, um, is it taboo to, to restore, like, let's say you have a 100-year-old car or even like my car, um, can restoration combine the old classic car with the future? Because I'm always wondering, like, what would it be like to see like a 100-year-old car that maybe does run on electric and has blind side detection or has crash sensors in the front so that it doesn't ever need to be restored again if it gets in an accident? You could drive it today and it'd be up to date. Or is it totally taboo to say, okay, classic car cannot mess with all those things. You can't put a rear view camera in a Model T or whatever, right? Is, is that taboo or is that okay? Well, this is a great question because uh, I know that there are probably more running daily driver Model T Fords on the McPherson campus than anywhere else in the world. So uh, how do you guys approach using those old cars? Um, I think that uh, the big thing with uh, what you're talking about is, is the sheer diversity and what the college has to offer. We have, we have people that come from all walks of life and everybody has a different opinion on what they want to do in the, in the industry. Um, we have guys that decide that they want to go and work on hot rods, even though that they go to a restoration college, they want to work on hot rods, they want to do resto mods, and they want to do like what you're talking about. They want to add the new to the old. But then we also have guys that specifically want to do concourse work and want to replicate down to the handwriting in the upholstery. We're such a diverse group of people, uh, just like the industry is, and um, it can go any way. It's, it's really just a matter of what you want to do with that, that career. Yes, Rich. I commend you all for what you're doing. Uh, thank you. Um, Paul, what do you look for when you're looking at a candidate? Is it someone that has curiosity, tinker, communication? I mean, what are the traits of the people that are successful after your 41 years of doing what you do? Passion. <laughs> You have to be like totally invested in what you're doing. It's, we, our hiring process in my shop is fairly slow and they might be interviewed by a number of people on the staff and it might take place over the course of a month or two. But we're really trying to dig down into what makes this person tick. And um, you know, you can find people um, that can do certain skills, but um, this is, this is hard. This is hard work. You know, you go through the shop and you see <clears throat> Porsches and Ferraris and Mercedes and all this stuff. It looks so glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> then you go over in the body shop on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday. So <clears throat> if you're looking for a job to just find some place to get in out of the rain and punch a time clock and take home a paycheck, it's not going to happen. It's, it's too challenging. Go work at McDonald's. Um, so that's, that's the basis. After that, of course, you do need skills and talents and aptitude and, and an ability to communicate with other people and not be antisocial. Everything that we do is done in teams. You have a project manager, you have a crew chief. You know, the, if the body guy is not talking to the metal guy about what kind of condition the the shell is going to come back to the body shop in and then while it's in metal work and you're doing replacing you know the door sill trim and stuff he's not talking to the upholsterer to see what the carpet clearance needs to be 
you're going to have a thing that looks like 86 people worked on the car when it was done, <laughs> instead of a you know a complete unit that's uh, consistent and looks appropriate. So uh, there's a lot of it, different aspects, but it starts with the passion to do great work and to do something you love every day. <clears throat> and that's something that uh, Dave uh, touched on earlier, and uh, I know that uh, we also heard from our McPherson students about as well. I was very, very impressed on, on my visit to the school in May with the presentations that were made on the 300S project, and they were given by the teams that had worked in these different areas, and there was never a reference to, I did this. It was always, we did this, this is how it happened. And it was very natural. It wasn't anything that was, that was at all forced or in any way uh, choreographed. It was, it, was, it was a group effort. Yes, sir. Uh, let me uh, start out first by saying it's very encouraging to see in young people uh, these days whose interests range far beyond becoming YouTube stars. <laughs> so, and, but my but many of them are YouTube stars on their own. <laughs> <laughs> my question is for all the three of the students. And, uh, 20 years from now, you'll be well into your careers in, in automobile restoration. What kind of cars do you see yourself working on at that point? It's funny, this morning we were walking to uh, the judges meeting and I pointed at a Chevy Silverado and I said, it's gonna be a classic one day. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't know, I think these cars that we're working on now will still be around. They, and we're not gonna run out of cars to restore. I mean, we're never gonna run out of them. But I don't know exactly what we'll be working on, whether it be IROC Z Camaros at Pebble Beach, or who knows. Yeah, I think that um, I think that uh, we we see the industry um, is changing already. Um, the '80s cars are kind of making a, a push, and uh, you can see the market kind of change. But I, I also agree with Ben. I think that uh, like the pre-war cars. They'll always have a special place in, in our hearts, and I think that um, just uh, keeping that light alive, I think that there's a very good chance that um, it's just going to keep growing. We're just going to keep seeing more and more marks emerge, and it's just going to get more and more diverse because it's, it's really a growing industry. Um, I believe like we are going to hit a certain point to where we're going to have cars to where it's like, like the cars of today where they're all electronic and things like that. I don't think that's gonna be as desirable as our classic cars today. So I believe we're gonna hit a point to where we're gonna be re-restoring the cars that have already, already been restored. And restorations in the future are just gonna be a bunch of re-restorations of, of today's classics. Oh yes, absolutely, please Paul. Um, with respect to re-restoring cars, I mean, we like to think when uh, something comes out of my shop, it's the last restoration the car will ever need, ever. The way these cars are, will be cared for in the future with the knowledge that people have about even preserving a restored car. But there's many, many cars that have been restored in the 80s and 90s with a different sensibility, a different sense of history. And those cars will need to be done over with a new perspective about their historic um, position in the history of automobiles and about authenticity and provenance and all this. And I think coming out of McPherson with the orientation and the appreciation for that kind of history, these will be the people that are doing that. And uh, Paul, you bring up another uh, very important point. I've been having conversations, you and I had this conversation a uh, short time ago, about the fact that we are also sort of nearing the end of the age where a car was either refurbished or restored in the 1970s or 80s, and they didn't take everything apart and take it all the way down to bare materials, so we still have hints and pieces of original materials. Now when restorations are done, the ability to document what your work is is absolutely paramount because the next person who touches that car won't be able to find those original artifacts. And uh, hopefully that's something that's also is, is a very important part of your education, what it is that you're doing now. Uh, yes, sorry. I'm just curious, you're, you're, you're at college, the, the, the school is uh, relatively small, about 750 students or so. Is this area impacted at this point and when will it be impacted or do you have the ability to expand substantially if the demand in fact is there? 
It's a question for you as our, our official representative, which is about um, the capacity to expand. I, I know, again, talking about my visit to McPherson, I thought, wow, this, there should be 3,000 students in this uh, program and uh, somehow just quintuple the size of the campus, and you're there, you're off and running. But there's also a point at which expanding the program changes the program because it's not as intimate and hands-on. So where's the balance, do you think, Paul? I think it's uh, incremental expansion in a rate that the <clears throat> the structure of the program can handle it and make sense. There are other aspects that, um, you know, are discussed from time to time about how things are evolving in the field, like the whole preservation field of true the, the art of preserving cars. That's a totally different endeavor than restoring cars. And that's something that, um, so how does an institution like McPherson get involved in the preservation field that really comes more from you know, uh, the art history and curatorial uh, field, uh, and how does that relate to cars? Well, that's a brand new field. So would they do that by collaborating with another institution and sharing and trading, um, uh, and or would there be, you know, longer term a, a possibility of satellite campuses and that? I, I, I think those are things to imagine, um, but it, it needs to be done on an evolutionary level where you don't get too big too fast and, and the foundation fall apart underneath you. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you see the expansive use of electronics and computers in cars affecting restorations in, say, 20 or 30 years? when you'll find that modules are no longer being manufactured, do you expect a, uh, a uh, aftermarket uh, system that's going to support those cars, or I'll leave it at that. That pretty much. I, well, I Answer the question, Paul. I, I want to ask these be, guys. Like, yeah, go ahead. I, will, I do expect there'll be small niche businesses that support those cars. Already there's some Things we had a little experience with um, a Porsche 959, which at the time was a really <laughs> high-tech car when it came out, and uh, it had active suspension uh, controlled by computers and ride height control and all of that. And there was a time when you, in order to fix anything, you had to take the computer out of the front of the car and exchange it from one for Porsche for a mere twenty-two thousand dollars. <laughs> <coughs> and um, and now Porsche doesn't provide that anymore for any number. But there's a guy in Florida that opens them up and he, he powers them up and then he looks at all the diodes and transitions inside with a, a digital infrared heat gun. And he tries to find the hot spots and the things that are malfunctioning, replaces those things and sends it back for 1200 bucks. So yeah. that gives me some faith. I'm sure there are things that are now all epoxied together and all that, but Perhaps somebody could make the whole little module, you know, in, in, in the small electronics shop and to serve the same function. So I don't know a lot about that thing, but I do have faith that other people who do will figure it out. It's a, it's a marketplace issue, actually. Uh, if there's enough people who uh, want the uh, dashboard in their Aston Martin Laganda to work, um, which it never did even when it was brand new for <laughs> too long a period of time. Uh, actually, a friend of mine, a friend of uh, uh, Donald's uh, as well, has, uh, has gone ahead and recreated the vacuum uh, or the look of the vacuum tubes in his, cars, and he, in his car and he's done it all electronically. So, I mean, it was, for him, it was just a computer programming uh, uh, issue and then finding the right diodes and the right uh, transistors uh, to, to basically fake the system, uh, but it looks the same and behind the dash it is different. So, I mean, there are always the workarounds, but it, it is always a marketplace issue. If, uh, um, you know, if people are restoring that car, then there's demand, the demand for that. So, and there is a guy who you know, uh, is able to work with his computer skills um, you know, that, that electronics keep marching on even faster than automobiles do. So, you know, the stuff that was in the car that you were driving, you know, that was made three or four years ago has already been eclipsed by something else. And a lot of times, you know, there will be a way to, uh, uh, to replace that with something newer and hopefully a little bit more efficient. So.
And I think that uh, what we've been talking about throughout this is skills which are difficult to replace or skills which are difficult to find. And that's what's at the core of the education that uh, the McPherson students are getting today. And I think this is simply an extension of it. As the collector market continues to expand, situations like this will, uh, will arise. I know that I said one more question. They're going to kick us out of the tent in a second. But you've been very patient. So yes, please. You guys are awesome. And um, I'm really grateful to see the youth going into this program. I'm, I work on a charitable group for Driving Young America and raising funds for scholarships for you guys. Um, but one of the questions I have is I'm in the middle of doing a restoration on a 1959 Mercedes 220S. And my husband's gotten the data card and I don't care about the data card. <gasps> I want it to be painted the way I want it. <laughs> Do you run into that situation and what effect does it have on the value of the card? Do we need really to have the data card? Does anybody really go back to the data card to see how the car was equipped and painted? Some people do. And I think that uh, Paul mentioned this uh, a little earlier. Uh, your opinion? Well, I, um, I was in a judge's meeting this morning at Pebble Beach. And so the data card would tell you what was the engine transmission and rear end number and all that. That's, that's pretty important that that still was born. And it doesn't have a 350 Chevrolet engine in it. <laughs> but in terms of the, the color, the most important thing is to do something appropriate for the period. You don't want to pick sand beige metallic for a, a 1999 Lexus, but to go down and you can find all this information on what were all the colors that were offered by Mercedes-Benz in 1959 and pick something you like. Um, that, that's well regarded and uh, it would hurt you a lot more. It, let's just say that you know, there was a color in that time period of your car called fantasy yellow. It's ugly. <laughs> You paint the car and it comes out ugly, you're going to be sorry and it's going to devalue the car because people buy things on its visual impact. So go down the list of the 1959 colors for Mercedes pens and pick something beautiful. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming once again this afternoon. I'd like to thank you Dave Kinney and Paul Russell and most importantly Ben, Nate and Dylan for being here and for sharing your enthusiasm and your passion. Uh, congratulations on being the recipients of these scholarships. And I know that I certainly feel that the past has a very bright future in your hands. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.